Factor portfolios do not or maybe barely survive transaction costs. Jack, uh, this would mean that there's bad news everywhere. Does this mean that factor returns are just not capturable? Could be the case that in some of these academic uh, microstructure papers where you're trying to estimate trading costs, those models might have been misspecified. All right, everyone, welcome back to this special episode of Coffee Hour. And I say special because with me today, I have one of our portfolio managers, Jack Vogel. Welcome, Jack. Uh, thanks for having me. And the reason we have Jack here today is because he wrote an amazing paper titled, Do Factor Portfolios Survive Transaction Costs? And it talks about, well, this uh, idea or con concern that some factor investors may have where yeah, maybe factor portfolios work on paper, but you actually, if you try to translate them to real life and trade, uh, there might be nothing left. So there's two main points in this paper. The first one being, what do academic and practitioner models say? And the second one being, what do life performance data infer? So first off, what do academic models say? Jack, you analyze three academic papers and they all come to similar conclusions. Trading costs reduce factor premiums with momentum, taking the greatest hit out of all tested factors. Specifically, the Novimarx Velikov paper, A Taxonomy of Anomalies and Their Trading Costs, estimates that momentum capacity is only at a meager $5.81 billion by using trade and quote data. So you're buying at the ask and you're selling at the bid, and we call this TAC data. This conclusion, however, is different from what the practitioner papers say. Jack, can you give us a rundown of what practitioners find using their own data? Yeah. Um, so first, there's two papers, but researchers connected to BlackRock use some of the data compiled from BlackRock's trading transactions, uh, live ones, live trading transactions, and found there's a much larger capacity for momentum and other factors than what academics would suggest. Uh, estimated anywhere between 27 and 65 billion for momentum. And if the trading occur over a couple of days, it goes all the way up to 136 billion to 324 billion. And then there is another paper by the AQR folks, uh, Frazzini, uh, Israel and Moskowitz, uh, titled Trading Costs of Asset Pricing Anomalies. And they use their transaction data to find that actual trading costs are an order of magnitude smaller than previous studies suggest. And they conclude the size, value, and momentum factors are implementable with the momentum capacity estimated at 56.16 billion. And so a natural question becomes like, okay, so who's right, right? Is it like academics or practitioners? And why is this gap so massive or big? Um, and the one thing is to note, uh, you know, that obviously there's a conflict of issue with practitioner data. So we have to be careful with their conclusions. But one thing to note is there might be a misspecification of the academic models. And so you might say, why? Well, from an older version of the AQR paper, uh, they used uh, the TAC data to estimate the trading costs for the S&P 500, right? Just uh, the, the market, but S&P 500. And what they found is if we use the TAC data and the academic trading models, it would suggest that the annual cost to trade just the S&P 500 is like 63 basis points. While actual data from like Vanguard had it at 12 bips and iShares had it around 7 bips. So it's most likely the case that the practitioners, or in this case, AQR's model, suggests that the S&P 500 trading cost should only be around six pips. So really, at the end of the day, uh, it could be the case that in some of these academic uh, microstructure papers where you're trying to estimate trading costs, those models might have been misspecified. All right, so one way to do this is to estimate trading costs using models but I think the next logical step would be to ask if there's any other way to measure trading costs. Jack, what's the next way you tackle this question? Yeah, so as you mentioned, the, the first papers we were talking about, what they did was they tried to actually estimate the trading costs via like microstructure data and microstructure trading data using the TAC, trading quote data. The other way to attempt to estimate trading costs is to try to infer the trading cost of live funds. 
And so this is done via a two-stage regression technique whereby researchers look at the live net of fee mutual fund and ETF returns and then compare them to factor premium returns. So any difference uh, can arguably be ascribed to the transaction costs in theory. And so how does this work? So first, what you would do in this two-stage thing is you're going to figure out the loading uh, on each factor. And then in the second stage, you're going to use these loadings to estimate what the returns should have been for the fund during the testing period. And so any difference between what we should have earned and what we actually return, the papers then attempt to use this to attribute any difference in returns to transaction costs. Yeah, so, so a, a paper by Andrew Patton and Brian Weller tests trading costs using this method that Jack just mentioned. And the paper's titled, What You See Is Not What You Get, The Cost of Trading Market Anomalies. And in it, the authors attempt to infer transaction costs by comparing uh, the factor loadings of live portfolios to the factor loadings of paper portfolios. So this step aligns market beta performance to be more similar to its actual life performance. While, and I think this is important to our conversation, it still concludes that there's still slippage in factor returns. And I'm just gonna read this from the abstract. After accounting for implementation costs, typical mutual funds earn low returns to value and no returns to momentum. So you know, whether you adjust for this market beta effect or not, the conclusions are the same and the following. Factor portfolios do not or maybe barely survive transaction costs. Jack, uh, this would mean that there's bad news everywhere. Does this mean that factor returns are just not capturable? Yeah, so uh, high level, we don't think so. But you know, without going into like nuanced issues on two-factor regressions, which there, there are, um, what I did was I decided to test the methodology used in the paper um, on paper portfolios. So in other words, like the tests that I'm running are going to be on paper portfolios that have zero trading costs. And so if I use this methodology, there should be no slippage because like by definition, there's no trading costs, they're paper portfolios. Um, and so on these perfect factor paper portfolios, I find significant premiums, right? Okay, that makes sense. Can, you know, basically follow the logic and the testing of the paper. But then the natural question arises is, do ETFs and mutual funds create, actually create these perfect factor portfolios? Like, do they create the Fama and French 25 factor portfolios? And for anyone who's like really dug into ETFs and, and funds, the, you know the answer to that is no, right? And so, you know, there's kind of two approaches that many managers take. So first, some managers are gonna kind of what's called closet index, right? And so when you do this, some of the portfolio is gonna be the market uh, and then some's gonna be factors, but it's not gonna be like a pure long only factor portfolio, right? And so what I did was I took these paper portfolios, had a little closet indexing. And what I find is that there's a complete statistical loss of factor premium, right? So, you know, the, the paper would argue, hey, well, it's insignificant, which means that all of the uh, return lost is due to trading costs. But in statistical terms, what I found on these paper portfolios is that it's statistically insignificant. So it's not trading costs, right? So that was one way I just tested to uh, discuss this. And then the second thing, which is definitely true, is there's a decent number of uh, funds and ETFs and mutual funds that happen to like shift factor exposures over time. These are like active ETFs, active mutual funds, right? And, you know, because like, let's be honest, a lot of uh, managers, especially in mutual funds back in the day, and even so in ETFs, are going to be a little more discretionary than pure quant. And so what I did was I said, okay, let's, let's do uh, another test whereby I'm going to take these same paper portfolios, but I'm, I'm going to allow the portfolios to vary from like value this month to momentum next month. So once again, uh, zero trading costs. And when I run this, I find the same result an insignificant premium. So, you know, the paper would say, hey, well, this is all attributed to trading costs, but I just found the same insignificant result using paper portfolios that have absolutely zero trading costs. So, you know, I was able to find insignificant results in paper portfolios using, you know, real world assumptions, which is that they're not perfect paper portfolios or at times 
the uh, portfolios might vary across factors, right? And so while like obviously trading costs do matter, right? Um, I think, and obviously, you know, we, we would assume hopefully that like people running uh, institutional money is going to have lower trading costs. I do think it's fair to say that it's not as black and white as some of these papers say, where it's like, hey, all factor premiums go to zero. Yeah. Um, in conclusion, there's, I think, a few things that we can all learn from this paper, or at least this is what I learned from this paper. The first thing is economic models are likely overestimating the effects of slippage. I think the main piece of evidence you presented here is that when you run TAC data on the S&P 500, trading costs are 10x what they actually are in real life. And secondly, practitioner data points to factor portfolios being able to survive transaction costs. Now, again, we do have to be aware of potential conflicts of interest. I think lastly, when comparing life fund data to other models, it's important to adjust for real life frictions as these frictions can destroy factor significance even before transaction costs are accounted for. So yeah, you know, one thing is modeling things in a perfect world and then the other thing is modeling things in real life. Jack, I think it's fair to say this has been a very product productive session. And if you're watching this video and want to read the paper, which I highly recommend you do, I'll make sure to leave that in the description. Lastly, if you want more educational content like this, you can head to alphaarchitect.com.